Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Abbiamo i tempi della, dello streaming, quindi dobbiamo essere attenti. Siamo online con molti, molti eh, delegati. Eh, è presto, quindi ancora la sala è un po' vuotina, ma dobbiamo iniziare. Il programma è, è bello pieno, è, soprattutto è pienissimo di relazioni molto interessanti e di relatori molto importanti. E, non so neanche quanti sono ormai gli anni della, del 9.Baby o del Tecnobios, probabilmente sono più di 20. Quest'anno, come tutti sapete, abbiamo una novità, nel senso che 9.Baby è entrato nella, nel gruppo di General Life e quindi abbiamo siamo ancora più completi e siamo ancora più grandi di quanto eh, eravamo prima. Eh, vi do il benvenuto a tutti, eh, direi che ci sono tutti gli strumenti e le possibilità di divertirsi tanto, come dico sempre quando si fanno i convegni, quindi sia divertirsi scientificamente che divertirsi poi nelle serate che faremo. Passo la parola un attimino eh, a Laura e poi dopo Giovanni. No? Sarà l'emozione di trovarmi qui con Andrea e Giovanni che sono degli amici di sempre e oggi dei, dei colleghi è una famiglia meravigliosa che abbiamo allargato, quindi sono veramente fiera che General Life abbia dentro la sua famiglia anche il gruppo 9.Baby, non solo Andrea e Giovanni ma anche tutto il team e stiamo iniziando un percorso meraviglioso che sarà sempre più fortificato da, non solo da, da un team molto forte, da una ricerca scientifica, da un programma scientifico meraviglioso, complimenti e dalla passione che mettiamo tutti in questo lavoro. Quindi vi auguro un bellissimo congresso e faccio i miei complimenti a 9.Baby per aver organizzato un evento così interessante. Grazie, dirò qualche parola in inglese anche per, per i nostri ospiti. No, no, it's fine. So, this is uh, our 22nd, maybe, uh, annual event and uh, over the years I think we've uh, put together a community in Italy among uh, art specialists and scientists. Um, this year we will uh, have a, a menu for all panels uh, in the sense that we have a number of topics both on the clinical and the um, uh, base science side. I'm particularly happy to have uh, some friends uh, from abroad that will give a a major contribution to our meeting, and I warmly welcome Natalie Vermeulen, Brian Woodward, and tomorrow we will have also Yanis Kunturis. And that will give us also a, a touch of international flavor to our meeting, also on the uh, specific, specific aspects of uh, uh, recommendation guidelines paper, papers. So therefore, uh, I hope you will enjoy this event over the next uh, couple of days, and uh, No, the weather is nice, so, um, okay, uh, enjoy the meeting. Thank you for coming. E dunque, Monica, ti invito a moderare la, la, la sessione. Il professor Albertini eh, si scusa tantissimo, ma ha avuto una problematica familiare, quindi non poteva proprio essere con noi non solo in presenza come doveva essere ma neanche in streaming quindi lo ringraziamo comunque di averci di essere stati vicini nella preparazione della, del meeting Monica Bene, buon pomeriggio a tutti Grazie Andrea per questo, questa possibilità di in qualche modo inaugurare gli speakers, e in tutti questi anni non ci siamo mai fermati, in questo mutevole mondo abbiamo continuato con il nostro convegno, questo appuntamento, 
nonostante il Covid e nonostante tutte queste cose che sono successe. È un bel colpo d'occhio vedere tutti di nuovo vicini e a viso scoperto, quasi tutti, quindi sono particolarmente felice di questa occasione che ci riunisce. Ehm, presento, il primo, presento il professor Carlo Foresta che certamente non ha bisogno della mia presentazione, professore di endocrinologia all'Università di Padova e membro del, dell'Istituto Superiore di Sanità. Prego. Ci parlerà dello spermatozoo e la fertilità, nuovi modelli fisiopatologici. Grazie dottoressa Cattoli, grazie ad Andrea e a tutti quanti quelli che hanno organizzato questo evento. Per me è un piacere, credo di non averne perso nemmeno uno, quindi mi fa veramente piacere tornare insieme a voi. Mi, avete, mi sono scelto a dire il vero perché tu mi hai chiesto di cosa vuoi parlare. Voi siete esperti di tutto, quindi parlare di quello di cui voi siete esperti era una cosa completamente superflua. Parliamo di qualcosa che invece forse merita qualche riflessione da parte di tutti. Lo spermatozoo, questo sconosciuto, nuovi modelli fisiopatologici. Sto pigiando, come faccio ad andare avanti? Eccolo qua. La patogenesi dell'infertilità. Anni fa partivamo con dei capitoli molto grossi, la genetica, le infiammazioni, le alterazioni anatomiche, le infezioni. Oggi c'è bisogno di un volume intero per inserire bene quali sono tutte quante le problematiche associate all'infertilità che comprendono gli stili di vita, che comprendono alcune abitudini, che comprendono l'atmosfera, le temperature, gli inquinanti eccetera eccetera. Per cui è impossibile oggi classificare in pochi capitoli quali sono i fattori di rischio dell'infertilità nell'uomo. D'altra parte voi sapete bene che lo spermatozoo prima di essere tale nasce da una cellula staminale che deve subire processi di maturazione molto complessi che vanno da divisioni mitotiche, divisioni meiotiche, trasformazioni morfologiche e attivazione dei suoi processi di motilità e di fertilizzazione. Tutti quanti questi processi avvengono nella fase delle divisioni essenzialmente nel testicolo ed impiegano due mesi. L'ultimo mese invece è quello della caratterizzazione funzionale dello spermatozoo e avviene nell'epididimo e nel deferente. Vi dico fin da subito che noi andrologi non sappiamo come classificare, come capire quando le alterazioni della fertilità dello spermatozoo dipendono da alterazioni funzionali dell'epididimo. Cerchiamo di capire intanto quali possono essere queste. Infatti, mentre del nucleo abbiamo trovato alcuni parametri di laboratorio molto importanti che ci, ci parlano di apoptosi, ci parlano di aneuploidie, ci parlano di alterazioni delle, delle doppie catene, eccetera, eccetera, nulla si sa per quanto riguarda invece la membrana nucleare spermatica. La membrana spermatica è una struttura di fondamentale importanza perché è proprio la membrana spermatica che esprime recettori, canali, alterazioni oppure stimoli funzionali che rendono lo spermatozoo in grado di fertilizzare l'ovocita. E questa membrana spermatica è di una complessità veramente importante, come tutte le membrane ha una doppia catena di fosfolipidi, e in questi fosfolipidi poi si aggregano i vari recettori, pensate a quello del progesterone per esempio, per dirne una, e tutte quante quelle altre caratterizzazioni che permettono la fertilizzazione. Attenzione, tra i fosfolipidi intercalano molecole di colesterolo. Teniamo in mente le molecole di colesterolo perché la variazione di questa presenza di colesterolo a dare cambiamenti funzionali alla membrana spermatica. Noi ci siamo incuriositi e abbiamo fatto un'analisi molto dettagliata. Quali sono i lipidi, quali sono le strutture della membrana spermatica? Questa è quella dei soggetti normali. E vedete che l'80%, l'86% delle strutture che compongono la membrana spermatica è a carico dei seminolipidi. Questi seminolipidi, state attenti, 
sono la molecola che viene prodotta soltanto dalle cellule germinali, li produce soltanto lo spermatocita di primo ordine e poi sempre meno. Quindi se la spermatogenesi funziona male, gli, i semi non lipidi non ci sono, ce ne sono molto di meno. Vedete che il colesterolo è presente in concentrazioni molto basse, però è importante, vedremo dopo, per caratterizzare la funzione dello stesso. Se noi consideriamo i normali e gli oligoastenozospermici, cosa notiamo? Una netta caduta di fosfolipidi e un incremento del colesterolo. Cosa significa questo, questa osservazione? Questo per dirvi che i, i seminolipidi provengono dallo spermatocita primario, ma ve l'ho detto anche prima, e questa è l'immagine che mostra chiaramente come i seminolipidi negli astenozoospermici sono fortemente ridotti e correlano con la motilità e con la concentrazione degli spermatozoi. Quindi questi seminolipidi hanno veramente un ruolo molto importante. Riprendiamo adesso il colesterolo che incrementa. State attenti, un passaggio importante. Da dove viene il colesterolo della membrana degli spermatozoi? Proviene essenzialmente dall'assorbimento del colesterolo plasmatico nelle sertoli. Quindi sono le sertoli che contribuiscono in modo determinante alla presenza del colesterolo nella membrana degli spermatozoi. Però cosa succede? Quando gli spermatozoi arrivano ricchi di colesterolo nell'epididimo, l'epididimo ha una funzione straordinaria, quello di depauperare la membrana di questo colesterolo. È proprio il depauperamento di questo colesterolo che influenza positivamente gli spermatozoi producendo l'aumento della motilità e della fluidità della membrana. Quindi se noi perdiamo, non perdessimo il colesterolo nella parte epididimale, avremmo tutti quanti spermatozoi immobili o ipomobili. L'epididimo diventa fondamentale e come vi dicevo noi non sappiamo ancora come studiarlo, come vedere se effettivamente funziona o meno questo epididimo. Questo è un esempio nel RAM che dimostra come le concentrazioni di colesterolo di membrana sono meno della metà rispetto a quelli che arrivano dal testicolo e questi sono gli uomini, sono i nostri studi e vedete che differenza c'è tra il colesterolo presente negli eiaculati rispetto a quello epididimale. Andiamo a vedere cosa fa questo colesterolo. Prendiamo degli spermatozoi eiaculati mobili Utilizziamo dei sistemi di laboratorio che ci consentono di arricchire la cellula di colesterolo o di depauperarla. La colestiramina è questa molecola che se è priva di colesterolo lo capta dalle cellule, dalle membrane, se è arricchita di colesterolo lo cede alle membrane. Andiamo a vedere cosa fa questo. Usiamo il sistema della, della merocianina per studiare la fluidità di membrana. Questa merocianina, questa sostanza fluorescente, quando incontra membrane che, perdono di fluid, che aumentano la fluidità, penetra nella membrana stessa, quindi esprime la presenza della merocianina, l'attività fluid fluidifica della membrana stessa. Se noi utilizziamo i nostri spermatozoi, li arricchiamo, lo depauperiamo di colesterolo con la nostra colestiramina, vediamo che quando c'è tanto colesterolo la membrana si irrigidisce, quando c'è poco colesterolo la membrana diventa molto più fluida. E qui vedete chiaramente come numero che oltre ad essere più rigida la membrana, gli spermatozoi mobili, e eiaculati, arricchiti di colesterolo, perdono la motilità anche se eiaculati. Quindi questo è un dato molto chiaro che ci dice quali sono poi le relazioni fra colesterolo di membrana e funzione degli spermatozoi. Questa è l'analisi che abbiamo fatto in soggetti poi oligoastenozospermici che conferma chiaramente il contenuto di colesterolo in questi spermatozoi e questo chiaramente vedete come lo spermatozoo in blu è il colesterolo, quando viene arricchito diventa ipercolesterolemico e quindi diventa con un aumento del blu. Attenzione, se nella membrana dello spermatozoo c'è tanto colesterolo, questo rischia di ossidarsi e quindi di avere dei chetosteroidi. E questi chetosteroidi hanno un'attività molto importante perché vedete che si interpongono in modo anomalo 
tra le molecole dei fosfolipidi, anziché incanalare il colesterolo all'interno come un pilastro, diventano come dire, degli anelli che disgregano proprio la membrana. Questo fa sì che le cellule vadano incontro poi, una volta che si siano formati questi chetosteroidi, ad alterazioni del nucleo e ad apoptosi. Questo è quello che si verifica. Quindi stiamo dicendo che la membrana è fondamentale, intanto perché caratterizza lo spermatozoo. Deve poi perdere alcune componenti, se rimangono queste componenti come il colesterolo rischiamo di avere cellule immobili e cellule che vanno incontro poi ad apoptosi. Tutto questo avviene nel tratto epididimo deferenziale, un mese di tempo. Come facciamo a dire che è un mese e non di più? Perché è stato già come dire, studiato a lungo e noi abbiamo visto che andando avanti è possibile che in questo mese possano avvenire tante cose. Abbiamo concepito un esperimento che ci permette di dire intanto se una situazione che si verifica frequentemente adesso ha ruolo nel modificare la membrana dello spermatozoo e in secondo luogo di capire quali sono poi i meccanismi attraverso i quali le modifica. Noi abbiamo preso la temperatura. Sapete che noi siamo un po' fanatici per quanto riguarda il ruolo della temperatura nella spermatogenesi. Sapete che la temperatura nel nostro emisfero sta aumentando di due gradi in media e noi siamo molto preoccupati perché la spermatogene si teme la temperatura. Vi ricordate che abbiamo studiato l'olter della temperatura nel soggetto normale, nel, nel varicocele e soprattutto nell'obeso. Ma per studiare in contemporanea la temperatura e quel mese di transizione dello spermatozoo dal testicolo all'emissione, Abbiamo, usato, usato, abbiamo studiato dei giovani che si sono sottoposti alle saune per un mese. Saune per un mese due volte alla settimana. Cosa è successo in questi signori? Guardate le membrane dello spermatozoo di questi ragazzi. Si sono infarcite di colesterolo. Gli spermatozoi con l'aumento della temperatura nella fase epididimale, perché nel mese vediamo solamente quelli che transitano l'epididimo, si infarciscono di colesterolo, perdono di fluidità. Qui vedete chiaramente quanto colesterolo si, si concentra nella membrana nel tempo e come cambia la caratteristica dei parametri seminali standard con la riduzione della motilità, con la riduzione di, della vitalità, e anche con l'aumento di quei famosi chetosteroidi che portano poi alla apoptosi e alle alterazioni delle strutture nucleari, come vi ho detto poc'anzi. Quindi abbiamo dimostrato la, la, come dire, la relazione fra temperatura, aumento di colesterolo e alterazioni di parametri seminali. Vi faccio notare che quando lo spermatozoo penetra nel tratto riproduttivo femminile di incontro in muco cervicale, Cosa incontra? Incontra l'albumina. Il ruolo fondamentale dell'albumina è chiaro, molti sono dei biologi, embriologi, quindi sanno bene che se noi vogliamo attivare lo spermatozoo dobbiamo coltivarlo con l'albumina. L'albumina capta come la nostra ciclodestrina il colesterolo dalla membrana. E cosa succede quando lo capta? Succede che lo rende più attivo. State attenti. Dove va lo spermatozoo una volta che abbia penetrato il sistema riproduttivo femminile? Va a caccia dell'ovocita e cosa utilizza per trovarlo? La termotassi e la chemiotassi, quindi la temperatura torna ancora in gioco. Infatti quando noi utilizziamo lo studio che ci ha consentito di individuare degli spermatozoi il recettore che viene attivato dall'aumento della temperatura della termotassi e questo TRPV1 e vedete come è espresso nello spermatozoo questo recettore, è questo che sente il caldo, è questo che guida lo spermatozoo verso l'ovocita. Quando noi andiamo a vedere come funziona il sistema, vedete che se mettiamo in una bolla spermatozoo e temperatura ambiente e poi colleghiamo questa bolla con due bracci analoghi, uno ad aumentata temperatura, uno a temperatura ambiente, vedete che gli spermatozoi vanno verso la temperatura ambiente. Allora cosa abbiamo fatto? Abbiamo preso degli spermatozoi normali, da una parte li abbiamo arricchiti di colesterolo, dall'altra li abbiamo depauperati di colesterolo e abbiamo eseguito non tanto la, 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 come dire, lo studio degli stessi ma abbiamo creato il discorso del termotassi. 
vale a dire siamo andati a vedere come migrano verso il caldo. Quando c'è colesterolo la migrazione verso il caldo viene pressoché annientata, quando glielo togliamo invece viene ripristinata in modo assoluto. Quindi l'aumento di colesterolo negli spermatozoi, oltre a ridurre la motilità, può essere anche un elemento che attenua di molto la capacità di riconoscere la termotassi e questo è molto importante. È molto importante perché abbiamo visto che il recettore per il calore, il famoso TRPV1, ha un elemento di riconoscimento di, mem- di-, di colesterolo nella membrana, quindi l'aumento del colesterolo blocca la funzione del recettore che sente la temperatura utile per la termotassi e questo è molto importante. Andiamo ancora avanti, dopo la termotassi c'è la chemiotassi che sostanzialmente è a carico del progesterone e l'alone di progesterone che poi esercita l'ultima linea guida per lo spermatozoo per penetrare poi nell'ovocita stesso. Questo è come funziona. Voi sapete che esiste un recettore per il progesterone che quando si lega al progesterone apre il canale per il calcio. Sono notizie ormai note a tutti quanti, non devo prenderle. E questa ultima attivazione fa perdere poi l'acrosoma e quindi la reazione acrosomiale. Se noi aggiungiamo il colesterolo a questi spermatozoi, noi perdiamo la capacità degli spermatozoi di rispondere al progesterone. Quindi vedete che abbiamo trovato delle situazioni di di clinica che sfuggono normalmente ai normali parametri del liquido seminale. Le astenozospermie, che noi consideriamo un peccato veniale per soggetto infertile, qualcuno si muoverà, in realtà non sono così semplici, non sono così facili da considerare innocue per quanto riguarda poi la fertilità. Io vado rapidissimamente avanti perché vedo che già Borini mi sta facendo gli occhi brutti e qui mi precipito e vado da un'altra parte. Di cosa voglio parlarvi? Stiamo parlando di spermatozoo. Parliamo di, degli endocrine disruptors. Parliamo degli endocrine disruptors che sono quelli che ormai rappresentano una spina nel fianco per la fertilità, ce ne sono circa 800 che sono stati sintetizzati dall'uomo e noi veniamo a contatto con questi endocrine disruptors pressoché continuamente. Voi sapete che noi abbiamo studiato essenzialmente i PFAS, sono quelli che sono essenzialmente presenti nelle regioni nel Veneto, ma tutti quanti noi siamo ormai invasi da PFAS, perché non esistono ancora delle regole molto chiare su come fare per eliminare queste sostanze. Noi li abbiamo trovati nel liquido seminale, nei soggetti esposti a PFAS, queste sostanze chimiche sono presenti nel liquido seminale e cosa ci fanno nel liquido seminale? Si legano agli spermatozoi, guardate in verde fluorescente sono i PFAS legati al nostro spermatozoo, e più passa il tempo di, come dire, di contatto più PFAS ci sono sugli spermatozoi. Ma perché noi siamo preoccupati? Perché una volta che si legano agli spermatozoi, questi PFAS alterano la membrana. La nostra membrana, che è lo scudo debole degli spermatozoi, si legano alla membrana, ne modificano anche loro la fluidità perché prendono il posto del colesterolo all'interno della membrana e quindi creano come dei ponti, come dei pilastri nella membrana, per cui la membrana si solidifica, non consente poi di attivare tutti quanti i recettori che servono per la fertilizzazione. E qui si vede chiaramente come si inserisce questo a livello di stabilità di membrana. Ma voglio andare in fretta perché capisco che se no andiamo fuori dal seminato e anche i PFAS come il colesterolo interferiscono proprio con i canali per il progesterone. Se noi prendiamo spermatozoi vivi, normali, eiaculati da soggetto normale, li li isoliamo e li mettiamo a contatto in modo artificioso con i PFAS alle concentrazioni che noi troviamo nel liquido seminale di soggetti esposti, guardate che modificazione importante abbiamo della motilità in questi pazienti. Dico l'ultima cosa e poi finisco. Un altro esempio di come effettivamente la membrana diventa nemica della fertilità, perché anche un altro inquinante ambientale come il cadmio 
è in grado di produrre questo tipo di alterazione di membrana. È noto a tutti che le concentrazioni seminali e plasmatiche di cadmio correlano molto bene con la qualità del liquido seminale. Noi abbiamo fatto uno studio molto complesso. Attraverso una microscopia elettronica associata alla spettrometria siamo andati a vedere dove si colloca il cadmio negli spermatozoi. Questa è un'immagine molto bella che non ho tempo di illustrarvi, ma vi faccio vedere che gli spermatozoi acquisiscono questo cadmio a livello di membrana sia nella testa che nella coda. Quindi questo cadmio è in grado di interferire proprio con la motilità degli spermatozoi. Concludo perché non voglio andare oltre. Vi ho parlato di situazioni che possono sembrare sperimentali, ma sperimentali non sono. Sperimentali non sono perché da una parte ci devono indurre a riflettere quando si hanno dei liquidi seminali, alla maggior parte, e mi scuso con i presenti perché non mi rivolgo a loro, ma la maggior parte dei biologi, degli embriologi con crude e dei ginecologi, che basta che ci sia uno spermatozoo maturo si può fare di tutto, non è così. Dobbiamo riflettere chi è questo spermatozoo, perché è alterato, perché non si muove, perché effettivamente attraverso questa analisi si possono fare, come dire, prendere dei provvedimenti molto semplici. Io mi ostino a dire agli embriologi lavorate sugli spermatozoi, lavorate sulla membrana, se, porete, se potete togliete la membrana degli spermatozoi, perché è un carro pieno di sostanze che possono essere inquinanti ambientali, che possono essere metaboliti di vario ordine e grado, che sicuramente non fanno bene poi all'ovocita quando noi lo iniettiamo all'interno dello stesso. Grazie. Grazie professor Foresta per la bellissima relazione. Essendo una lettura non, non abbiamo... Spazio per le domande, quindi lascio ai miei colleghi la nuova sessione. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to stay here today and I would like to thank Novo.baby in particular, uh, Andrea and Giovanni for inviting me at this symposium. It's for me a great honor to moderate this session because I think that we are living uh, an important period for us where things are rapidly changing and all the advantages in the technologies that we are introducing in our field are redefining the frontiers in reproduction. So I think it's important for us to achieve new knowledge about these technologies. So that's why I think that this is, important. this is an important moment for us, and I hope to learn something new during this session. So I don't want to waste time, and let me introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is uh, Professor Ledda. He's a full professor from Sassari. That today he will speak about the 3D technology in reproduction. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Valerio. It's nice to share this section with some friends. Even I can say there is a lot of Sardinian people. This. There is a, like an overdose. And um, anyway, with people like Lino, we grow up uh, in science uh, for the beginning. So it's, it's nice pleasure. So we move quite soon for this talk because I think. Okay. Sorry. Uh, it, it will be like a run because uh, there are several subjects that I would like to touch. And uh, one will be on the follicular growing and the IVM system. 
and the largely has been experimented, especially in, uh, in lab animals and less in large animal models, less in human. The other one will be 3D ovarian extraction with several techniques. And the last one will be embryos, like a blastoid or synthetic embryos. That is something that's rising up in the last time. As you can see, many of the results I'm bringing will be on mouse. We will share some results that we are producing in our lab. And uh, I will touch some of the subject. I will not go deeply to say and to present all the data. So why 3D? Of course, uh, for a long time we use a 2D system, uh, but we, and also the 2D system give us a lot of uh, answer for our questions that we were put in biology, but we finally, we, we see that uh, in the 2D system, we are modifying the cells. In the 3D system, system probably we are keeping the more the cell phenotype and cell function as the original tissue they are deriving. So we can probably more simulate what happened in, in, uh, in nature. So this is an example of what happened in 2D compared to the 3D system. And they are grow in the similar support. That is it's very like the Petri dish plastic. In 2D system, basically, the cells try to be flat and they just keep the contact between the borders of the cell. If we produce a Petri dish with the pores, the cell try to be inside and maintain the round phenotype and try to establish contact as uh, the original tissue. So they are performing in a more natural way. And uh, what, what is the results? Which kind of signal we are using in the 3D system? Basically, we are using two major, two, two kind of signals. One is the biomechanical and one they are the chemical signals that they are, we are need still to discover and to understand. So the biochemical signal is coming from what happened in nature. We know that the cells are growing in, the, in our body in the several places and they are growing according to the stiffness of the background or where the, what is around. In many cases, the ECM or any support in the, any system where they are growing. It's interesting to see that uh, when we are growing the, our cells in the polycarbonate, or so low, uh, again, the Petri dish system, the stiffness is very hard. So anytime we are putting embryos or sites or whatever, growing the cells, uh, we are stimulating them biochemically, probably not in the proper way. And uh, these two signals are to address the cells to keep us, again, I, I can remember, is for the original cell type, if it's possible, original cell function, to keep the cell to cell content, and also in a more complex system, 3D system, to have the extracellular matrix system to, to grow up them. So th for this reason, we develop many of these 3D culture system using the hydrogels, created some scaffolds that could be from organic or inorganic or created some cross-linked hydrogels, so mixing what is uh, synthetic with the natural one. And the other approach is to use a small volume. So we want to keep in the 3D system more the paracrine and autocrine signal concentrated, so the culture should be in the small uh, volume system. And the, in the reproduction, quite often the culture is performed in mini drops or in mini cells. And uh, I mentioned here another technique that we show quite soon, that this liquid marble technique. So the culture of follicular into the matrix on to grow follicles in vitro is quite a long story. And this here, there is a paper, it's old more than 30 years ago. And this is where the pre they started approach to grow follicles in the collagen. So Quite often, you use uh, natural hydrogels, and uh, you can see here there were some growing of uh, follicular structure to obtain some uh, uh, groiner size. But of course, uh, uh, particularly I want to mention here Evelyn Telfer, because many of you know her. She was studying very much this kind of, of the follicular growth. And then she was basically showing that we have three phases that should be taken account. One is the reactivation of the follicular population while it's to grow properly in 3D system. 
that is mainly the second step, the third step, and the last step is to mature the oocyte. And there's uh, another example, just showing that uh, in an hour combination from biochemical and chemical signal, in this experiment in mouse, they were cutting pieces of ovaries that they were putting the matrigel plus activin. There was uh, strongly support the growing of the follicles. They were able to grow until maturation stages and to get offspring. And even more, we can use not only the preantral follicle, but we can use the primordial follicles. So we can grow up in the very early stages. In this, and uh, and uh, in, the, in this experiment is shown here, we, use, we can use also the primordial germ cells and drive them to primordial follicles and drive them to fully mature oocytes and to have offspring. So in the mouse, it's very evident we can manipulate very efficiently and we can derive offsprings. To say this is, that this offspring is completely normal is another question mark that we can touch later. It's, it's quite more simple to think about 3D IVM system. So maybe we can think the on, also during the in vitro maturation, we can perform in 3D system instead to the floating system that we are using normally. And here we perform some experiment using this uh, liquid marble technology. The liquid marble technology, simply speaking, is to coat our cultural media with a super hydrophobic powder that is, is surrounding the cultural medium. We can, use, uh, we can make drops in the different volume because we can uh, use uh, 30 microliters drops, but we can scale to five microliters. And inside, we are doing the vitro maturation. So the cumulus cell expand there and try to contact each other and to contact to the body of the drop. And this is more or less simulate what happened in the follicular uh, section. And the, the first experiment we were using biocompatible super hydrophobic powder. In this case it was with the teflon, but unfortunately with the teflon powder we cannot see inside, we cannot monitor. And the secondly we use the a powder derived by the silicone. In this case, it, we can see, it's completely transparent, we can see what, uh, what is occurring, so we can monitor the expansion of the cumulus cells. So six years ago, we performed this experiment with Daniela, and this is the, how the drops is uh, put in the powder to be coated, and now the drop is resulting after the coating procedure. I don't know if you can see the arrow here. So, this was the results. We couldn't see any, to be honest, any increase in the maturation rates, any increase in the blastocyst rates, but we see it was a feasible technique. So we see the rates we, were, we, were had, with, we had with the, this technology was quite similar to the control one. When the second experiment we performed with another kind of sites, so the ones collected for pre puberal animals, that we know they are, have, are low competent, and we use the same technique and we try to analyze more in detail what was happening. In this case, we see an interesting improvement of the blastocyst rate and analyze some gene expression. We see the beneficial effect of this uh, 3D IVM system. So, it seems that can help, especially when you have a low developmental race system. Moving to the ovary. In the ovary, this is more or less what you can do. So the wish is to create an ovary outside the body and to try to develop possible fertilized oocytes and fertilized offsprings. Again, this is more possible to in the mouse where the results are very interesting and less possible at the moment in the large animal models, less possible in human. Just keep in mind that in the ovary, we have this extracellular matrix and we have uh, many fibers that are composing these extracellular markers and they have some orientation. They create some nets and the follicles are in contact with these nets. And this is the, what happened in, in a normal condition 
And uh, according to the net organization and the contact, you have some biochemical signals that are translated in the cell function, as this slide is showing. So keep in mind this organization. Uh, in the literature, are reported some possible artificial ovaries. And I would like to talk in especially to the bioprosthetic ovaries of the La Ronda group, because I think it's interesting in terms of uh, approach. So they bioprint some surface, in this case using a gelatin that was cross-linked, was combined and modified to be more resistant. So they organize a, a plate with micropores, and they put the follicles in this micropores. And they use a net with different combinations, different angles they were creating. They put the follicles there, and they grow these follicles in vitro, and they found that uh, angle orientation, so this in terms of biochemical signal, biomechanical signal is quite important. They obtained the best growing when the follicle was in contact with two in the angles of these fibers. So this is again expressing how biomechanical can exert an effect in terms of uh, growing. And this is the experiment looking the follicles as they were growing, so these follicles, they were marker with GFP protein, and this was the result. They obtained an offspring, finally, by this bioprosthetic ovary in mouse. So very exciting result. Another approach could be to cluster thicker cells with granulosa cells to combine them to create a multi-layer in vitro 3D system, to put an oocyte inside and to create a, such a follicle artificially and an ovary artificially. So another strategy, less promising than the ones I showed before, but interesting in terms of uh, approach because it's more simple in some way. Another approach that you, we can use for the ovary is to use the biomatrix that you can have from the ovary so the results could be to kill all the cells in, in the ovary and just to use the skeletal, the matrix, to repopulate with new primordial, new gametes there. Here you can see what happened in the liver if you are removing all the cells, became completely transparent and we just uh, the extracellular matrix structure. And here an experiment was performed by the group of Milan we are collaborating, especially Georgia Penarosa. She was doing the same thing as the ovary. So in the ovary you can get again a structure deprived of the cells and they try to repopulate its ovary and they, what is, is happening is like a sweet home sweet. So the cells love to repopulate what it was original, the home of these cells. So they are going to repopulate them and start to create some such a follicular structure. So another strategy could be to use this uh, decelerate ovary. Moving to the last part, I think that I can be in time because I still have five minutes. Sorry if I'm running a little bit, it was like to have some fresh, is to embryo story. So in the embryo story, again, with the group of Milan, we are in this, uh, we, we think of this experiment five years ago, but as uh, up in Italy, in many times we don't have uh, so much energy, so many people to drive the experiment we are thinking. It is a pain all the time. So the experiment was uh, thinking that way. We have some fibroblasts from the skin. In this case, it's coming from the dermal of, after the cesarean section. So again, still close to reproduction. So these fibroblasts, they were put in culture. They were induced to be pluripotent by epigenetic erases. And the idea was to drive some of these cells to become like ICM cells and some cells like atrophoblastic cells. So with the right chemical signal, you can produce cells that they look like this kind of, combine them and thinking to create a blastoid. What do we think, if you remember the liquid marble technology, also we put this experiment inside and we have seen that, that these cells, when they are induced to be pluripotent, if you are putting them to be cluster, 
to because ferrules, they keep the factors to the pluripotence for longer instead of to maintain the cell and to do the culture. So we produce, the idea was to produce clusters, ferroids, and after to organize the multicellular combination with the trophoblastic cells. And the uh, one collaborator of, George, uh, of uh, Tiziana Brevini, laboratory of Tiziana Brevini, Shannon Arcuri, was inducing the modification in the trophoblastic cells. We already know how to modify in the pluripotent ways. And the, in the ex final experiments, we tried to produce some blastoids from the human cells. And you can see here the cells are in the molar layer. They are clustered here in a special chamber. And they are, are reconstructed to become a blastoid. So what is the... Uh, it's similar to the blastocyst. It's not like a blastocyst, to be honest. But uh, looking at the gene, they express the genes related to the trophoblastic cells. They still express the genes related to the ICM cells. But anyway, we are far away to say that it's a really blastocyst structure. And the means to create this, this structure is mainly to understand what happened in embryology instead of to think any more. <laughs> And another approach we are using in my lab with uh, uh, my collaborators is to work in the sheep model. Again, we have a fibroblasting culture in the, uh, similar to the experiment I showed before in the human. We can produce uh, some pluripotent cells, but instead of to add the trophoblastic cells derived by the fibroblast, the idea was to obtain some pieces of trophoblast tissue from fetuses of 30 days to grow up them into the system and to cluster them and to organize a multicellular system to create a blastoid. In this case, it's the combination of pluripotent cells plus fibroblast in culture. So this is the, the blastoid we were obtaining. And this is the microplate that my guys are producing in the lab. These are agarose microplate because we don't have the stiffness effect that we have in the hard plastic. This is the cave, the small space where the cells are located. And these are the blastoids they were derived after the culture. So we are now looking to analyze genes and to see if they are really embryos or similar to the embryos that you can have naturally. Okay, the last uh, thing is very impressive because uh, in the mouse again, group from England and group from Israel, they were showing that you can go over. So okay, you can create blastoid, but you can go for the later stages and you can have uh, the post graduation development in vitro in the mouse. And so this is an experiment again, thinking about the biochemical, biomechanical and the chemical signal. So the experiment is organized to aggregate the cell here in a static way to organize the blastoid because you can work in the static system and to organize a floating culture system for the later stage because you need a different biomechanical signal and you need a system that can oxygenate such big tissue in the proper way. So this is the, in this combination, different biochemical system, you can probably go later in the developmental stages. And you can see here, it's very impressive. And if we, if this again, the description, this uh, complex system for the culture, again, here the static one, here the movement one, here the system is shown in the machine that they were developed, especially in, the, in Israel. Here the embryos are growing for the post gastrulation stages. And here you can see they resemble what is the normal development of the fetus in the early stages. So they try to understand how this post gastrulation was going up, and they, they look in the neuro development, and they found that they were organization the neuro complex. They look for the heart organization. They found that they were chamber of the heart that they were developed. So it's very impressive to see how much they move on, on this direction. So 
which will be the scenario. In terms of uh, barometer impression, we are moving very fast. I think we are still in the cloudy condition. In some cases, we are moving for the sunshine direction. And if you will look at the TripAdvisor evaluation, I think uh, the interest is very high. The actual progress, I assure you, is very interesting. The technical difficulties are still important. The knowledge, what is happening, is very low. So we don't know what happened in terms of epigenetic and changes after this agricultural system. The last is to thank all the collaborators for this part of work I presented to you, the group of Milan here, and uh, the group of, uh, from my lab, also they were working very hardly, and also thanks to the cost action, we were involved for four years, we were for 3D self-fit, it was uh, giving us a lot of opportunity to understand this world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, for this fantastic overview. Uh, I would like to remind you that the discussion will be at the end of the session. And now it's a great pleasure for me to leave the words to my co-chair today, that is uh, Valentina Lodde, um, in order to present the next speaker. Thank you, Valentina. Good afternoon, everyone. And I would also, also like to thank Giovanni and everyone uh, that organized this beautiful meeting. And thank you very much for inviting me in particular and all the veterinarians that are going to talk today and I think this is a proof what, about what you were saying before that it's very important to uh, that clinicians know what we do in the lab to really start to work together to you know um, to have some results in, in the future and to improve what you guys do for real. Uh, so thank you, Giovanni, for putting this beautiful meeting together. Uh, so um, the next speaker um, is Professor Pasqualino Loi from the University of Teramo. Um, the, the title of the presentation is, is Cloning by uh, Somatic Cell Nuclear Transfer, more than 20, uh, 25 years on, a promise fulfilled. Thank you very much, Valentina. I would like also to thank also the organizer for inviting me, and actually the title of my talk wasn't, you know, uh, decided by me, but I think Giovanni did, Andre, I don't know about her, but I think it's entirely appropriated. I feel perfectly, you know, uh, at home. Yeah, I'm a vet, and I'm an experimental embryologist, so I'm going to tell you about a completely different story, so I, I really hope to entertain you in the last 20 minutes. How to go? Okay, so... Yeah, that's a kind of uh, uh, working uh, model that I've taken from the winner of two years ago, Nobel Prize. I don't like very much competition, and all I want to really invest in something that nobody else is doing. And this is exactly what I was doing when I started my career as a PhD. I work actually in a group that since the beginning started to do the first thing, I'm talking about more than 30 years ago now, they were doing the first embryo transfer, and the first tag of an embryo really took me. It was like you know, a kind of flesh, you know, opening in my brain. In my brain, I said, I really want to do that. And a lady, a professor in the Faculty of Biology in Sassari, I grew up in Sergio's Red Laboratory, gave me as a gift a like a manipulator made of stainless steel and black, like Henry Davidson. I really loved it. I took the manipulator and brought it to the laboratory of Professor Naitan, and then I started as a self-made man to do my first embryo games, and I'm still there. Embryo manipulation is something I've done at the very beginning of my PhD, and I'm still doing it. I think I will, I will stick on it since I will be a scientist. Yeah, I put on this slide all the major steps, you know, from the early uh, multiplication of embryo by splitting, what done by the magic Steve Willans and in Cambridge by the time, and then blastoma separation, all this kind of, maybe you don't know this, uh, they're not really, uh, how can I say, usable in, in your clinical settings, but for the veterinary point of view, it was very important to have, to multiply embryos coming from high genetic married animals, okay? And then of course, I moved along the path when uh, embryonic cloning was made available, still from Steve Willans and of course, you know, the kind of the climax was reached when Keith Campbell and Ian Wimwood published The Birth of Dolly the Ship. 
then it started to be much more complicated for us to, to do to carry on science because you know uh, crawling becomes such a kind of uh, bad word especially in Italy so it was very difficult it's still difficult to carry on with research so at the beginning of this of my path there were very very few people an handful of scientists of over the world maybe seven groups after Dolly the cloning people became very crowded so, so many but now cloning is no longer sexy so I think we are back to the handful of people doing nuclear transfer so very few groups are doing it for many reasons that I'm going to try, I'll try to explain you in my next slides. So why? Why I'm still doing this? Well, there are many reasons. First of all, I'm a scientist. I really want to understand what actually makes, takes a difference in the cells and raises all the differentiation on its epigenome and then you know, starts from the very beginning. That's really kind of puzzling issue, completely unsolved. And still, I find it very fascinating. The other is that, you know, I'm a vet and I work in close contact with animal, with colleagues and dealing with animal genetics. Now the selection criteria are very much different from 20 years ago. They want to select the very uh, strong and robust animals. They don't need a vet. They don't want to be a, to, to see a vet. And they're also have been able to cope with climate change to be able to produce in a global warming perspective. So selecting animals and using artificial insemination is going to be very complicated. With cloning in theory can actually copy and paste the selected genotypes that will be much easier. That's one, one reason and then actually is getting very, very, how can I say, fashionable again. The second one is, uh, which is not in here, but I'll go back. Endangered species, yeah, I'm sure you are well aware that biodiversity is, you know, coping with a very, very difficult times because, you know, the extinction rate nowadays has increased. It's no longer under control. So, there, as you can see very quickly from this slide, so some of the animals are really critically endangered. And on the top of the list, you'll find this northern white rhinos. And so, I think... Yeah, that's only two females with these animals are left. And uh, of, as you can see, they are really guarded by military guys because, you know, they are very close to be extinct. It's the most endangered animal on the world, on the planet. So, in 2015, actually, gathered all together with a few scientists, like Yashi, Thomas Hildebrand, the guy in here, and um, uh, Frank, these are uh, German uh, embryologists and uh, clinicians that are working on large animals, myself and Cesare Galli, a few more. So I decided to, to see whether we can explore, we can, we can exploit our reproductive technology to save these animals. So far, actually, little has been done, but not really no, something important, actually, not very little. But Cesare Galli and Giovanna, they have isolated the stem cells from these embryos. So they made embryos from rhino, which was really, really challenging. But apparently with rhino, everything goes. It's just like in human sites. It is very easy to make, to get embryos. And from these embryos, I remember the first two blastocysts, they established two stem cell colonies, which is something just incredible, a kind of blessing, if you want, given the emergency situation of this animal. And of course, you know, this paper was published by Cesare and all the biorescue is called the group. At the beginning, it was very difficult because, you know, we are using our own money, but eventually now people are donating money for this research, and actually the group is thriving very well. And, but, so my role in the project should be to clone the rhino, but I'm not ready to do that. And then I put here the question, which, you know, Giovanni has, has given to, to me, the, the title of my talk. So is it, after 25 years, is there any progress? about deficiency especially. Well, I, I wouldn't say so, I'm afraid. You can see here, I put in this little graphic, the situation, you know, I'm working with it until the two days ago, so it's very updated. In 2086, you see, so sorry, 1986, the first embryonic cloning paper was published on Nature by Steve Willansell. And it was kind of, you know, really, I really started it, I liked it very much, but not many people were doing it. It was kind of, how can I call it, elite niche research. And until 1997, when Dolly was, paper, paper Dolly was produced, you got only 127 
papers, very, very little. After Dolly was an explosion, okay? Thousands of papers published, hundreds, the best groups actually working on nuclear transfer. But if I put on the, ba on the baseline in here, deficiency, if you see deficiency, which is the number of animal born from manipulated embryos, is still the same. So there is no improvement at all. Yeah, a lot of technicalities have been solved, but the core issue, the, the, how can I change, how can I completely remove the information on adivinicated cells by nuclear transfer, I think still stand. So, yeah, that's... Also, if you, I told you, Dolly really killed us because, you know, he created such a negative perception in Europe. If you put cloning in your grant application, it will sink. It's a kind of you know, mathematic situation. So, is, I, I've been doing work on cloning using leftovers from my other projects. But it's really, really impossible, especially in Europe. This is a very strong ne negative perception. So, it's difficult to push. Yes, there is no progress, but it's also through that, you know, uh, grants and money and financial possibility are not given at all, people, to so scientists doing this job. So also, as I wrote you here, European Parliament is very, very against it. So the Green Party actually has banned completely the import of, any product, of food production for the United States, because they're actually are using cloning to make beef. In China, they are also cloning beef, cloning pigs, and they are cloning a lot of horses in Argentina and in, uh, in um, uh, Australia. Some other cloning applications, they are cloning pets. I just read the other, last week that Barbara Streisand has cloned this dog for $200,000. But that's not the field I want to work in. So, I think, of course, the logical results, mouse, uh, is a very ideal animal. The only progress is happening in these pieces, and of course, Japanese are leading the, the, the field nowadays. They are progressing a lot, especially these two guys, the senior and the, and the, the junior author of this paper, Ogura and Yakuayama. They are really leading scientists in the topics, and they are actually working very, progressing very fast. Um, I just I don't want to go into the details. I'll just tell you what are the targets, you know, how they want to uh, optimize nuclear programming. Um, according to Ogura's work, was published on PNAS in 2011, they use using RNA interference to knock down cyst expression, and they have noticed that there is an improvement, okay? All this work was done only, only in the mouse. We cannot do the same in farm animals. You don't have the same molecular biology background knowledge, so it is very difficult to do that. Um, shall I go, so? I get confused. The other approach, always from Ogura's group, is just to remove, you know. They found this, the region in the genome, they called it reprogramming resistant regions. And so they found that, you know, they are associated at a very high level of H3K9 methylation. So they inject a messenger RNA, RNA in those sites to remove that express uh, histone demethylation. So in that way, they were able to demonstrate that, you know, these embryos derived from, you know, this de histone demethylated nuclear somatic cells were reprogrammed much more successfully. But it wasn't so, because actually nor exist, and nor actually K, the demetylase expression were able to fix the issue, because they're both associated to um, epigenetic abnormalities. And Ogura has been very good to get a nice publication, you know, even if it's a both, how can I say, a disaster from the uh, advancement point of view. So. That another paper from, uh, from Asugura, they are actually, that's again mouse, and they are resorting to very radical approaches by getting, knocking out a large domain, you know, downstream H19 gene, which calls for 49 microRNAs. And they found in doing so, actually that's the placenta, well, something that you don't know maybe, but one of the most common epigenetic defects in cloning is a very large placenta, okay? 
So especially the spongiotrophoblast layer is completely, you get twice of the normal size. So we have here, you can see normal, the normal clone. With a few mouse. Um, the app there does IVF. Down you can see easily that's a placenta for a clone. On the right side you can see actually the two placenta. They say the phenotype is more or less adjusted, if you see. But still, I don't think that's the, 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 the way to go. The only thing that works in all the species is an uh, induction, induction of global hyperacetylation of the east of the eastern, and then you get a better result. So. There are some, you know, how can I say, um, positive results. This paper was published by Kevin Singler. So these animals are cloned from the cell cell line that gave a birth to Dolly. And they are perfectly normal and okay. They are doing well. And I think we can, there is still room for improvement. And this is what we are doing now. I think it is not like, there are some hope. There are some direction actually can be taken. And then what are the requirements? First of all, cloning has to be traversal. And you can see here, cloning is a kind of copy and paste mechanism. So there are 23 species from flies to frog to fish and mammals that have been cloned. So it's a copy and paste mechanism that can be applied to all this, most of the species, okay, including vertebrates. And how, how, how to improve it? Well, I can tell to my students, we are not inventing anything. You have just to watch around and the solution are there. Nature offer them to you. Spermatozoa is the best nuclear transfer device. Carlo Foresta just gave us an overview of it. So I started to be very much interested, let's say myself, can I take the chromatin of somatic cells and change it into the spermatozoa one? So in other words, make, take a solenoid organization, I mean, nucleosomal organization in a somatic cells, bring it in a toroidal structure of spermatozoa. That was an impossible mission, seems to be. But then I met this guy, and the guy is uh, one of the leaders in uh, epigenetic in spermatozoa uh, uh, physiology. So he started to he give me all the vector. He started to repeat, to induce in somatic cells all the steps leading from a nucleosomal organization to thoroidal organization. It didn't work. But you know, then I got a very, very brave PhD student and say, why don't we, do, why don't we transfect directly protamine to the somatic cells? In fact, some of the other vertebrates, like fish, for instance, they do this and they do very well. We did so, that's a very old picture from Martha, my co-worker, you can see here, cell expressing protamine started to be very compact. So we started to focus on this. These are nuclei from control uh, fibroblast. And then you have, you know, after transfection with the protamine with a flourishing tag, you can see that the, it started to nucleate in, inside the nucleus. And then they compact after 48 hours the nucleus in a structure which is very similar to the spermatid nucleus, okay? These are some section of electron microscope, early compaction, you know, the, the fossa is, is here, and then fully compacted, a cross section of this, very close. Structure is very similar to the spermatozoa, as you can see. So you're very happy about that. These are intermediate steps, but it's not really worthy to see. Also, this just to show you that effectively, a somatic cell turn out to be, morphologically speaking, a spermatid cell. Of course, there has no tail, no the other details, but we don't want that. This Domenico Uso, he published this paper a few years ago now, and then, of course, we keep moving with it. Next question was, can you reverse the protaminization? So these are fully protaminized somatic cells with the tag. And then we did it, the experiment. Marta Cernik did it. That's the nuclear transfer embryo. You can see in red the, the, pro, the protamine. And then three hours started to disappear. You can see the blue from the DNA steady with that with etched. Six hours later, no more, more protamine is left. So that's, it was very, very, you know, I was very happy also because, you know, these cells used for nuclear transfer were able to increase the number of blastocysts. So 
Marta's published this paper, everything is very repeatable because there are kind of you know, 80 replicates. Everybody can do the same in his lab. And then that's the last. We wanted to follow, to stick to the spermatozoans, to the spermogenesis model. So their round spermatid are in G0 states. The other crucial step is to induce an hyperacetylation. Luca Palazzese, a PhD of mine, which is now working in Japan, uh, did the same. He actually induced G0 by serum starvation. ST stands for serum starvation. And trichostatin A, which improves the acetylation of the genome. And he was able actually to improve the proteinization. So I think um, we are getting not really close, but I think I'm quite optimistic. You know, 10 years ago, I was quite, I would say, maybe I would change my field. I decided to stay there. And then actually I was right. And then some work has been done here by Domenico Yuso did a JSPS uh, fellowship in, in Ogura's lab. And these are, you know, the number of cells you get in a control, nuclear transfer embryos in the mouse. These are in a nuclear transfer embryos we use in proteminized cells. These are nuclear transfer embryo control with tri trichostatin A. And you can see here the number of cells with an embryo reconstructed with protaminine cells. So I was very happy. And then I'll go quickly to the conclusion. Definitely, we get a much better nuclear reprogramming, at least to the blastocyst stage, using protaminine cells. We are transferring this. Of course, the experiment is not done in Italy. I didn't get any money to do that, but they're doing the nuclear the embryo transfers in, in Poland, in Warsaw, in a project which is coordinated by Marta, my co-worker. Yeah, we are going to do this and then, so now the final word has to come from the lamps. I would like to see after 20 years, I'm transferring again embryos made by cloning using protamine, protamine cells and let's see what happens. I hope to tell you better news in the next time we meet each other. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor. Now we can introduce the last speaker. Last speaker is uh, this session, Danilo Cimadomo. Danilo is a science research manager of the General Life Group. And today we will speak about the artificial injectors to standardize and enhance embryo assessment. Thank you so much, Danilo. Thank you, Valerio. So thank you, everyone. And I want clearly to thank Andrea and Giovanni for the very kind invitation. It's always a great pleasure and, a, and an honor to be here, especially in this very innovative session uh, of uh, of the Congress. So first of all, I want to uh, stress the fact that uh, already the very first inventor of a uh, uh, computer, Alan Turing, was the one who proposed the possibility that uh, in the future machine perhaps can think. So uh, from the very beginning, we had to rely on the possibility of artificial intelligence. And if we think that uh, the first baby born from IVF, Louis Brown, dates back 1978, well, you can imagine that the first uh, artificial neuron instead dates back 1943. So at the end of the day, AI has been around far more longer than IVF uh, uh, has been. So uh, my duty during this presentation is try to understand uh, how uh, we can use artificial intelligence in the IVF laboratories. So I divided the presentation in three chapters. The first one is standardized and uh, reproducible embryo assessment. So we know that one of the most uh, relevant non-invasive parameters uh, of an embryo that we can uh, adopt to predict competence is embryo quality. So static embryo quality per se. We know that it associates, uh, although slightly, but significantly to euplidy. So we might have about 56% of excellent quality blastocysts that are euploid and down to 25% when it comes to poor quality ones. And these were data from our group that Antonio published in 2014, uh, but if we rely to the graph uh, below, it's a huge study from a Chinese group in which uh, uh, you can see how uh, there is a decrease of euplady with decreasing uh, blastocyst quality and day of development, and same it goes with competence. So also when you transfer euploid blastocysts, they have a lower implantation rate when uh, they are of a lower quality. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that uh, embryo assessment is highly subjective, okay? 
So this is something that we did together with, uh, within CIER. So we circulated across uh, 18 IVF centers in Italy and 36 uh, embryologists, uh, 100 pictures of human blastocysts. BT stands for before training, AT stands for after training. And if you see at the end of the graph, well, basically you can see that the agreement for expansion, inner cell mass and trophectoderm, was just fair uh, after, before training. It increased, but no more than moderate. Uh, sorry, before training, it increased no more than moderate after training. So at the end of the day, you know, it was pretty much non-consistent, especially across laboratories. So at the end of the day, we rely to a parameters that uh, we clearly demonstrated it is highly uh, subjective. When it comes to junior embryologists, you see especially the trophector that perhaps is one of the most important confounders on implantation, even in the, uh, when it comes to euploid blastocyst, just was 0.26, the agreement between them. So the point is that obviously in case we are going to transfer all blastocysts that we obtain, this is not going to impact the cumulative labor freight, and this is the case for Italy. But when it comes to countries in which embryos like these, so poor quality blastocysts or day seven blastocysts are not even considered, these may in turn impact also the cumulative labor freight for the patient. So you know, the choice that we, take, that we make based on embryo quality might affect also the chance of the patients to conceive. And this is something that we estimated in a paper that we published uh, in, th in 2019. In case we would have prevented poor quality plus, so lower than BB, according to Gardner Schoolcraft, from being transferred, uh, our patients would have suffered about 2.5% decrease in cumulative labor freight. And when it comes to patients older than 42, could be as much as uh, 5.2. So, you know, it has a, a pretty relevant uh, impact to the point that also in countries such as New Zealand, Australia, or US, the group of Dean Morbeck started to say that perhaps we should consider C-grade blastocyst for dedicated patients. So not, you know, as a, a common choice, but uh, based on counseling. So this is a, maybe one of the first studies when AI was applied in IVF, the group by Coach Ravi. Uh, what they did at Whale Cornell University, so they asked to five embryologists in top quality centers across the world to evaluate, evaluate some embryos. And as you can see from this Venn diagram, just in 89 cases, they were concordant. I mean, I'm talking about you know, lab directors in five IVF centers. So what they did was to train an algorithm, uh, a freeware algorithm that you can use, you can access it uh, on the web. It is called Stork. To do what? To do this, pretty much homogenize the view across the, the different laboratories. So at the end of the day, in each clinic, if you rely on AI instead than on embryologist assessment, that embryo would have been called poor quality or, or bad quality uh, pretty much consistently. And this add an association with the chance that the embryo would implant. So we are using, actually we're testing in our, in our center, our um, software is called CLOE. Uh, it generates an embryo quality score. Uh, we try to associate whether there was an association between the embryo quality score and the evaluation made from our embryologists in the lab. But as you can see, there is a significant association, although if you see you know, the variability between the different uh, box plots, it was pretty wide. So what, what are we trying to do? We are trying to optimize uh, the way this tool is going to assess uh, embryo quality. That is not just you know, how the embryo appears, but we are trying to rely uh, on objective parameters such as euploidy. You can see here in those graphs euploid embryos, and you can see still them also uh, at very low uh, embryo quality score. But even more important, live birth after euploid embryo transfer. So try to optimize, fine tune, uh, these uh, scores so that at the end they will rely on the real competence of, uh, of the embryos themselves. What else can we do? So we, we were talking about static morphology, let's move to morphodynamics. So we know we can assess uh, how an embryo develops, the time of two cells, three cells, so, and so on, up to blastocyst stage. Uh, this is a study that has been done in the academic context uh, in a French university. So they train an algorithm in order to perform ma um, automatic annotation. And as you can see, they compare manual annotations done by the embryologists to automatic annotations, and there was an almost perfect concordance, 0.92 R squared. And the CROI score that, that we are using was validated across six uh, uh, UK centers, and uh, the uh, concordance between the embryologists and the score was strong, if not very strong for all parameters. This is instead a very nice study, in my view, from the group uh, 
of vitro life, the IDA score they used, and um, they were very honest to say that the version 1.0 of the IDA score was as good at the moment, as good as at the embryologist in predicting live birth. So you may say, okay, I'm not you know, improving the possibility of defining what embryo is going to implant. Well, the point is that this is done automatically, so without losing time in making the annotations. So uh, at the end, I think that it's already per se uh, a very good achievement for the very first version. So what we're doing in our lab is to try to see how many times our embryologists are discordant with respect to the IDA score in defining among uh, different embryos in the same court the one that we should transfer first. So how many times the, the IDA score would have changed our assessment clinically. And you say, as you can see, if we can rely only on uh, morphological evaluation, in 14% uh, of cases we would have transferred an embryo different from the one that the embryologist would have chosen. But when we rely on euploid uh, that would happen in 32% of cases. So if we relied on the IDA score in 32% of cases, we would have transferred a non-euploid embryos before the euploid one. So this is something that we are trying to do in order to, ass to assess the real uh, clinical uh, uh, impact uh, of these tools. So now, what's the problem when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence studies uh, in our field? Very few of them follow uh, the conventional uh, workflow that we, should, uh, that we should follow. So you should have a data set, one that you use to train the algorithm, one that you use to validate the algorithm, and then a third data set for testing, so to understand the positive and negative predictive value of your prediction. And obviously, possibly the test should be done in, a, in another center, so from a multi-center perspective. No, not really the way several studies have been done uh, up to date. So in this study uh, from Riegler as well by Krag, uh, they were uh, stressing the four concepts. First of all, when it comes to AI, we should rely on the nature of data. Data scientists, they say garbage in, garbage out. So if you train algorithm on poor quality information, you will get poor quality uh, predictions. Uh, you should rely on a data set that uh, encompasses all the possible conditions. Okay, so we want to have these seven embryos, we want to have poor quality embryos. So if you already have a pre-selection of the embryo uh, you feed the algorithm with, well, obviously, it will not be able to uh, assess uh, those embryos in the future. Ideally, you should not rely on clinical pregnancy, but possibly on live birth, because that's really what we want uh, to predict. And then there is the sample size. You know, Google is the master when it comes to artificial intelligence. They train their, al their algorithm on millions and millions of data, not on a uh, few hundreds, thousands of uh, embryos. So uh, that's extremely important, and obviously multi-center uh, studies should be conducted. But let's say from the time being, how can we use AI in our laboratories? I always rely to this uh, nice quote from Harry Poincaré. He said, science is built up of data as a uh, home is with stone. But a heap of stones is not a house, just like a group of data is not science. Okay, so we need people trying to make the most of those data to have information that we can apply clinically. So to turn uh, raw uh, time-lapse data, for instance, in clinical useful information. So this is what we are trying to do. It, I, there are some of my colleagues that help, were helping us in this process, Anna Marconetto, Federica Innocenti, Samuel Etrio, were very active and they contributed to the publication of these two papers. One was based on the seven blasts. So we wanted to objectify through AI the importance of uh, uh, the seven blastocyst. So this, this is the first thing that we could do. As you can see in a picture, time lapse can increase the number of information we can get from an embryo. For instance, the area of the embryo. So we don't have time to make annotations. You can imagine uh, assessing the area of an embryo. So automatically, and at each single stage, it will give us an area of the embryo, an area of the embryo including the zona pellucida, and obviously by difference, the thickness of the zona pellucida. So the, all this information, uh, were able, uh, we were able to use this information to objectify the fact that the embryologists in, laborato in our laboratories were biopsying the embryos when they were fully expanded. And this was pretty much consistent across all time ranges from, from less than 120 hours post-insemination up to more than 168 hours, so even beyond seven days of culture. So at the end, we were not forcing the embryos to be uh, biopsied in that day, but that was the moment in which the embryo was ready for biopsy. Based on this uh, information, we showed that about 15% of human embryos develop beyond day, seven, beyond day six. 
the, the line, the red line that you see is 144 hours post-insemination, which is the end of day six. Uh, they come from oocytes uh, older, so from you know, older patients. Uh, they were, the embryos were of, of a lower quality, whatever you call it, so the embryologist as well as the uh, fertility score. Uh, they, starting, they started the expansion process later, and it, was also, it also took longer. So normally it takes about 10 hours between the, the start and the end of expansion. In this case, it was 10, 20 hours. Uh, and then you play the rate. Uh, they were less euploid than faster embryos. But if you adjust in a, a logistic regression analysis this information from the, for the quality of the embryo, as well as for the age of the oocytes, well, the day of development was not associated in any, anymore. So in other terms, they were less euploid because uh, of a poorer quality of, from uh, uh, older patients. What about live birth? That's really what we want to assess. Well, they are less competent, even when you adjust for confounders, but we were able in about five years to have 10 babies out of 40 euploid uh, day seven embryos transfer. So it's about 25%. That in our, in our view is definitely not a negligible. Um, rate. If you see this graph, again, the red line is 144 hours post-insemination, and it's very difficult to see, but there are green spots at 168 hours that are babies born from day 7 embryos. So, you know, that's the point that we were able to objectify through AI. So how we do we translate this information to our patients? Well, if we would have stopped embryo culture in day 6, we would have lost about 4.4% of, pa of patients with at least one live birth. We would have lost about 13.7% of our patients that didn't get pregnant with faster embryos that still have a chance through day seven embryos. And we would have lost about 5% uh, of our patients that still have the possibility to conceive a second baby after they already delivered uh, with uh, faster embryos. Second thing that we published was about uh, human blastocyst spontaneous collapse, which is this event that you can see here in this video. We define it as a continuous reduction of the zona pellucida area, so of the whole embryo, uh, after the initiation of blastulation in a process that lasts te less than 10 hours and results in an uh, embryo proper to zona pellucida area, which is lower than 90%. Uh, embryos that undergo Blastocyst spontaneous collapse after blastulation, they will degenerate in 21% of cases versus 13% uh, in uh, embryos that do not collapse, and this is significant. And the higher the number of collapses, the higher the degeneration rate. So this is, let's say, uh, an event associated with some sort of pathological state for the embryo. Uh, through AI, we were able to show the duration of collapse, so provide for the first time this information. It lasts about 1.5 hours, but it can be as long as five hours. The average largest shrinkage, uh, it's about 35%, but it can be uh, as down, down to 10%. And the embryo to zona pellucida ratio at the end of uh, collapse, it's about 80%, but it can be as small as 30, uh, 33%. So all information that our assessment, will, you know, manual assessment was very limited to, to perform. But you know, the interesting information is that it's a very common event. Half of our embryos, they collapse at least once, and one out of five collapsed two times up to nine times. So it's a very, very common event that is associated with slower development. You see in blue, according to the number of different collapses up to nine, they start blastulation almost pretty much at the same time, but each collapse and re-expansion, because obviously the embryo has to, re to re-expand, delays the achievement of full development. Uh, these embryos are all of, of a lower quality, excellent quality blastocyst, uh, do not collapse in 64% of cases versus just 37 in case of poor quality blastocyst. And this was shown also when uh, the embryo quality score by fertility was adopted. But what does that mean clinically? I mean, this collapse associated with lower euclidy, yes. Uh, even when you adjust for oocyte age, blastocyst quality, time of biopsy, and uh, blastocyst area at the moment of biopsy, the embryos that undergo a at least one collapse are less euploid. And again, the higher the number of collapses, uh, uh, the lower the euploidy rate of these embryos. When it comes to live birth rate, after euploid blastocyst transfer in collapsed embryos, it is lower, but not to the point uh, that we can say 
um, it is associated with uh, you know, a lower competence of euploid blasters. So still, as you can see in the graph, embryos, euploid embryos that collapse four times or more at an implantation rate of just 14%. So again, we can use this information to fine tune uh, our predictive uh, power beyond euploidy on uh, embryo implantation. This is something that also other groups are doing. This is an example of a group in a way in which they train an algorithm that from the moment of starting blastulation takes a picture of the embryo every two hours and assesses the areas. So you have the area of the embryo from the moment of starting blastulation up to the end. And as you can see between uh, pregnant and non-pregnant uh, uh, patients, uh, the embryos that expanded more in a slower time, uh, they were more competent. Uh, obviously, mm, what we are doing now with our master E in Rome, Gaia, Saturno, Marilena Taggi, they are trying to assess whether also direct cleavage, uh, uh, higher fragmentation, 1PN, 3PN, automatically detected through AI, uh, can be uh, associated with the lower competence of this embryo. So, you know, again, to objectify the observation that we make uh, uh, on our embryos. It stopped. It crashed. Well, last chapter would be about automation, but I'm pretty sure that Roberta Maggiuli will talk about this topic uh, during the program. Uh, but, uh, you know, I want just to stress, uh, uh, doesn't work, to stress two points. We can automatize through AI, and this will, sa will save time uh, of the for the embryologists in the laboratory. And, uh, you know, it, it has been estimated that uh, when we moved from uh, uh, double embryo transfer, cleavage stage, uh, untested embryos uh, to blastocyst stage and euploidy, the time, the hands-on time of the embryologist increase, like from seven hours to 13 hours. And this is something that also the Asebir recently uh, confirmed. So, you know, if we prevent investing time in uh, useless um, manipulation in useless duties such as witnessing, for instance, you're implementing electronic witnessing system, or uh, tank, cryotank refilling, we already implemented in our center in Rome a uh, uh, totally automated uh, cryo room that refills the, the, the cryotanks uh, pretty much consistently any time they go under a, a certain level. Uh, you know, this is all time that embryologists can invest uh, in trying to make the most of the information that we can obtain uh, through AI. So this was just the information I was showing. And something really interesting in terms of key performance indicators is that if you put in contact, in connection, electronic medical records with time-lapse system through AI, you can actually perform key performance indicators in real time. You can cluster the results automatically according to the operators, according to the incubators, according as well as to the culture media. And these are, you know, very powerful tools that perhaps we will be using in the future. So getting to the conclusion, it, it has been theorized pretty much 20 years ago, but maybe we are getting closer to the possibility of a lab on a chip concept in which we have automatic sperm selection, microfluidic devices for changeover of culture media, automatic denudation of our oocytes, automatic manipulations and assessment through AI. So this is a, a very nice uh, commentary that Laura published together with Bart Fauser. Uh, as you can see, when we implemented uh, uh, blastocyst culture, then time lapse, the workload, the manual workload of the embryologist increased. Now with the implementation of manual annotations and AI, it will collapse, but this doesn't mean that we are taking you know, off jobs for embryologists because embryologists will invest now that time in intellectual workload. So how to improve the algorithms? And, you know, Marcos Meseguer recently said that it's not very far a moment in which perhaps in IVF we will be working together with data scientists, with bioengineers, together with, you know, clinicians and geneticists. So mentioning one, one professor from uh, uh, US, he said that we should partner with AI, lead and not follow. This is extremely important because humans should act less like robots so that robots can act a little bit more like, like humans. Since ultimately what we should fear obviously is not the killer robots from Armageddon or, or, or Terminator or whatever, uh, but it's our own intellectual laziness if we are going to rely only uh, on, uh, on, on AI. So what makes us different from computers, and this is what in my view we should stick to, 
curiosity. Pablo Picasso said computers are useless because they give you only answers, so it should be us posing the questions to computers, communications. It's not important, it's, it's not reasoning per se that makes us humans, but reasoning upon reasoning. So, you know, metacognition, be critic about what we uh, learn. And obviously empathy, uh, the computer cannot transmit those information to the patients, to the clinicians, it's us that should mediate the information. And with this, I thank you for your attention uh, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Danilo. I can't wait the moment that I have a tool like uh, uh, something like, hey Siri, can you check my yes. laboratory and tell me how it goes? But it's not today, unfortunately. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. So I think that we can start the discussion. Yeah, if the other speaker can come on stage, please. <laughs> we don't have enough. We apologize because we don't have the seats. And I will open the discussion for, I mean, the, the, the floor for question if there's anyone. There's a question there. Um, thank you, all of, all of you. Um, Lino, yes. <laughs> I have a question because um, yeah. I have little knowledge about these things. Uh, how can you possibly, uh, um, all sides, um, having received a nu uh, cell nucleus developed properly without having a, a sperm centrosome? Say again. In somatic cell nuclear transfer, yes. one major actor is missing, and that is the sperm centrosome. Don't yes. you think that affects a lot the following okay. development? Okay, well, I love centrioles very much. I know, yes, you, all you need is just, you know, a nucleus and a functional centriole. I don't think centriole is a limiting factor in nuclear, in nuclear programming, especially because now you're using. Um, commonly G0 cells. So we'll have a, yes, if we, you may use a G2, you can get with two centrioles, you don't want that. But you know, the complication there will be the double number of, you know, DNA. But you know, normally we use G0, G1 cells with a single centrosome. So centrosome is really something that is not a major factor. Thank you. Danilo, I have a question. Great presentation. My, my question is on the hours that we use to define day six or day seven. So if I have understood well, uh, you, you, you make a, a cutoff on uh, 144, that is six uh, days. Six exact days from X. Yeah. When, uh, when you consider day seven, so is... Uh, for 145, 46, 47, and have everything. So most of the time, people can also think that it's day six, if you consider the day, yeah. you know? Uh, so my, my question is not on the, the problem of the, the cutoff, is uh, the 4.4% of embryo that uh, uh, became a baby, or uh, like birth, you said, were in the 145, 46, or so in 170, 180 hours? Uh, it was very small picture actually in the, in, the, um, in the slide, but we showed the dispersion plot in which you have, you know, the hours post insemination, and each single embryo also clustered according to quality. Uh, we have like out of the 10 babies in day seven, five of them were like 163, 164 hours. Because, you know, obviously it always relies also on how the logistic of the laboratory is, is organized. So how many slots you allocate for biopsies according to your daily workload. So normally we have a slot like at lunchtime. Yeah. And then we reassess the embryos bef before leaving uh, the laboratory like at six, uh, five, six in the, in the afternoon. That's a very pertinent question because also the reviewer asked us that question. So we have a, actually a graph within the... The, the paper, in which you also have the hours post-insemination post -insemination related to the hour of the day 
like whether it was one o'clock, two o'clock, and it's, you know, you can see it. We tend to biopsy early day five, early day six, and early day seven in the morning, late day five, late day six, and proper day seven in the afternoon. So that's pretty much uh, the idea. So, you know, the fact that we use AI to this is, you know, provided us the possibility to gain trust from the reviewer that when we talk about day seven, they are real day seven embryos. It's not like depending on when you do X. I have a question for Professor Ledda. Um, when you show the results of the study made with um, our colleagues in Milano, Tiziana and Fulvio, you said, uh, if I understood correctly, you took the fibroblast from cesarean section. Yeah, it was the dermal front. Dermal front of cesarean section. Yeah. Um, do you think that the fact that these cells are progesterone embedded during pregnancy can help or can behave differently if you took um, fibroblasts from other tissue not, not uh, embedded for eight months of pregnancy? Yeah, I, I don't believe that uh, this progesterone exposure could be modified very much the behavior of the cells after you have uh, reprogrammed them with epigenetic uh, erases because uh, so the group of Milan, has a, they have a long story to change the cells and to drive the cells sometime to, to become something more specialized. So according to the experience, and also what we have performed in our cases in with a sheep fibroblast, it seemed that the origin of fibroblast that you are collecting and exposure to the hormones could be not modify very much. In the sheep, for example, we are deriving them from the ears, so the dermal fibroblast for biopsy we are performing in the live animals. And they seem to perform in, in, in a similar way. Um, hi. Uh, it was great lectures, the three of you. Uh, thank you for that. My question is probably to the three of you. We hear more and more concerns about the epigenetic consequences, stuff related to our culture system that are very simple compared to what you presented. So I was wondering how big is the concern uh, in your 3D, um, the cloning stuff that when I saw you cutting my half an embryo, I mean, it was well, feeling a pain. Um, and also for you, Danilo, bringing this culture up to day seven and that my, what I said, is the most extreme one, and the epigenetic really kind of mess, yes, I will answer for first if you want. Yeah, I agree with you, that's really challenging. It is not, not impossible, but very difficult to recapitulate exactly a normal, you know, epigenetic profile in the somatic cell. Some is maintained, the economy has to get rid of all of it, and the other one, you know, it has to be built again. So it is complicated, but yeah, that's a challenge. That, that's the major complication because we fail systematically to erase completely the epigenetic information. But on the other side, I think nuclear transfer, you can see it, you can make uh, lamps if you want, but you can use nuclear transfer just to investigate epigenetics. So it's a wonderful model to study epigenetic itself. So either way you see nuclear transfer, you might find kind of, you know, positive things. Is, is, are you happy with that? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, if I kind of did something. When we are talking about these epigenetic changes, of course we are afraid. And sometimes we are using very much this uh, word. And uh, in the same way, there is a very great plasticity that can cover in some ways what we are inducing the epigenetic changes, especially in the embryos. And I would like to say this story because it's very interesting. It's related, it's, it's a, even it's a little bit far away. There was a period, even with Lino, we were working on parthenogenetic embryos to generate some fetuses. They were only famous one. 
and they are able to orientate the cells to create a fetus, even with the heart beating. When we analyze the cells, they were losing chromosomes. They were hypoploid, but even they were hypoploid, they were able to drive properly and to make some organogenesis. So there is this big plasticity that sometimes is very fascinating that maybe we are lucky can cover some epigenetic induced changes. Obviously, because of time, I didn't have a chance to go into the details, but we make a changeover in the, in the five. Okay, in the morning. so if we do not biopsy the embryo in the five in the morning, you make a changeover. So it's a continuous media. I'm not going to tell which one, but it's a continuous media that we use up to day five, and in case we change. So technically, uh, I mean, I cannot say, but clearly we are monitoring these babies born. Okay, so we starting from uh, perinatal, uh, postnatal, early postnatal gestational outcomes, they are all consistent with uh, you know normal thresholds and uh, results we should expect. Epigenetics, we'll see. I mean. <laughs> ask a final remark, just, just a little. But of course, you know, none of us is, is ever thinking to clone any human. So that really has to be said. This is a kind of deterrent. Eh? So, so that's really an extra reason to don't even think about that. Okay. Can we can you have cross questions between the speakers? Danilo, yeah. yeah. can I ask you? Can I ask you a question? Because you know, when you were showing the, the, the time lapse movies, and then there is the collapse, I understand that you know, the more collapses events you can record there, the less is the, the chances the embryos to get into a baby. Well, what, what are the reasons why the embryo collapses? Well, uh, there's a pretty long discussion in the, in the paper because uh, actually we don't really know. Uh, so there's only theories at the moment, and many of them are biophysical theories. So what I did was to call this guy at, in France University, Hervé Toulier. Uh, he's a physis physics. So he's actually studying how cavities form in, uh, in cells normally. So you know this process of releasing media, uh, so con liquid content within the cells, that should be compensated for, for what the other cells are releasing. And there should be a certain level, you know, in which you release, uh, and you know the whole hydrofract, hydrostatic pressure is maintained within the, 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 the cavity. So if these processes, I'm not going to go into details because there's you know really important equations behind this. Uh, if this is not maintained properly, the embryo collapses. And same it goes for other uh, cavities, liquid-filled cavities in uh, biology in, uh, in general. So they are studying how uh, from the moduli embryos get to the blastocyst stage through this, uh, these processes. Uh, so, you know, we contacted them and perhaps in the future would like to try to understand this, but can be even related to the mitotic rate of cells. So if they are not together at the same time, uh, growing and uh, multiplying, that might cause a collapse. So that, that's just theories at the moment. And I think with this video analyzed through, you know, physics, uh, AI, you know, in a multidisciplinary team, we can try to give an answer to these biological questions. When it comes to IVF, we try to, re to rely, obviously, on the possibility they have a clinical meaning. But there is a whole biological, physical aspect behind that is very active in terms of uh, research. Thank you. Danny, quick question. Uh, curiosity, more, 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 than, more, more than a question. So, uh, you show that when we have collapsing, Apart from great presentation, it was amazing, full of data and content, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, w when you're looking at collapsing uh, and you see that there is a reduction in the live birth rate of embryos going through this collection event, this is all coming from like retrospective data analysis, right? So there is no study that you are aware of that has applied this in a prospective way in order to capture of the clinical variability and get a, some more yeah. insight about the clinical gain yeah. that we can get from that. No, 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 that's a very good point. You know, uh, it's, it's retrospective data, and obviously when we have to choose which embryo to transfer first, you, you preselect the ones that, they, that did not collapse. But for a simple reason, they are slower, so we, we tend to transfer before the embryos that are fast. So uh, the idea now is to adopt this information generated through these systems 
uh, to make an objective evaluation. So if in the future you have a score that will take into account also that, that thing, if you do it blindly, well, you can have an, ass an assessment of the real positive and negative predictive value. So that's something that we are doing. For instance, not with, with fertility, but with the IDA score, it's what we're doing. So it's only me and a few people in the lab, like Viviana, who know which is the IDA score, but we're not using it to make clinical choices. And afterwards, we will rely uh, whether there is a prediction or not blindly. So that's what we're trying to do. That, that, that's actually a good point. So if there is no other question, we would like to close the session because we are perfectly on time, just five yeah. minutes late. So we were very good. Thank you very much. And I think there's coffee break now, right? Yeah, right. Thank you so much again.